But again, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he, you know, if you look at his example the, and how he was and how we reacted, we should also react like that. For example, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in a room and, so, and a man came in and he said that, you know, your, your, your people and your family, they say that you're a Sabi. And a Sabi in Arabic is a very, it's an extreme insult. And what it means is that you're a, a heretical lunatic who's outcasted by society. I mean, it means all that in, once, in, in one. Right? And so he says that. And what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu say in response? No, no, they are. They're the they're heretical, outcasted, lunatics, not me. Now, he didn't even say it. He didn't defend himself. He didn't say, no, I'm not. It's not me. It's, it's, I, I swear, they're wrong. He didn't say that. He didn't get up and violently protest and say, I'm going down the street and going to go you know, burn down uh, the, the, the Quraysh's uh, you know, buildings and so forth. All right? He didn't do that. His example, his reaction was, كَذَلَكِ يَزْمَعُونَ that's what they say. So, so what? Right, that's what they think. Let them think what they want to think. Let them say what they want to say. Right? And that's how he was with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And another example is when Aisha, who was his wife, who was very protective of her husband, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when uh, some of the Jews at that time passed by and they said to him, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum is, means death be upon you. Right? We have Salamu Alaikum, peace be upon you. And they said, Salamu Alaikum, death be upon you. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu response was, Wa alaykum, and to you. And then Aisha got upset from what they said, and she said, Salaamu alaykum, wa la'natullah, wa ghadabahu, wa adabahu, you know, death to you, and the anger of Allah, and the punishment of God, and you know, this curse of God, and this and that upon you. Right? And then what was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu response? You see, that's the natural response of somebody who really loves the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And very few people loved him more than his wife Aisha. Radiallahu anha. And... Her response of being so protective and, 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 and loving and attached to her, her husband, she you know, instantly reacted. But then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu response to Aisha, which is the response we should take, is Mahlan, Mahlan, Ya Aisha. Slow down, slow down, calm down. Mahlan in Arabic means slow down, calm down, Aisha. And then she says, Yeah, Rasulullah, didn't you hear what they said? They didn't say salam, they said, Salamu alaikum, death be upon you. And she says, Didn't you hear what I said? Wa alaikum, and to you. <laughs> Yeah, you, okay, and to you too, right? And so this is the character of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And many times, you know, he says, Uditu fala wa lam ahad. I was harmed in the way of Allah that nobody else, in a way that nobody else was harmed. We have to remember some of the stories of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An example is in the Battle of Uhud, when the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, uh, they throw rocks at him, they try to assassinate him with spears, they chip his tooth, his bottom lip is bleeding, his forehead is split, okay, blood is dripping down his face, and, you know, he falls into a ditch, and he gets up, and we, that we knew at that time that, you know, that, that if the blood hit the ground uh, of, on, of that soil, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would destroy all the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time. So what does he do knowing that? Because he says that in the hadith, if my blood would have hit the ground, the noble blood of the Prophet Muhammad, the best and greatest of all creation, right, the master of mankind, the most beloved of all beings to God, if his blood would have hit the ground, Allah would have completely annihilated his enemies. But, because he was a mercy to the worlds, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ I have not sent you except a mercy to the worlds. إِنَّمَا أَنَا رَحْمَةٌ مُحْدَى It's a beautiful hadith that a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I'm only a gift of mercy. I'm only a gift of mercy to all of you. You see, and it was that mercy in his heart that caused him to catch his blood before it hit the ground. To stop it from hitting the ground so that his enemies would not be annihilated, who were trying to kill him. Who were trying, trying to kill him. They just threw spears and rocks at him and he fell in a ditch and he, he's bleeding all over the place. They're trying to, and he catches his blood. And then his response, when he catches a blood, one of his companions comes in. This is the reaction of the companion. He says, Ya Rasulullah, your dua, your prayer is answered by God. So make dua against them that Allah destroys all of them. Because they're fighting us, we're defending ourselves, and they're killing many of us. And they just injured you. And we're losing this war. It's the battle of Uhud. Right? 70 companions died. And Rasulullah's response, which should be our response, was, Allah Mahdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people, for verily they don't know. What is it that they don't know? They don't know I'm the messenger of Allah. They don't know He's the greatest of creation. That in terms of creation, He's the king of kings. All the kings in the world, He's the king of all of them. They don't realize the reality of Rasulullah. So He says, they don't know who I am. They don't know the message I brought. They don't know who the Quran, what the Quran really is. So Allah guide my people for verily they don't know. Not Allah destroy my people. 
Allah guide my people for verily they don't know. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide those, you know, who, the, the Muslims and the non-Muslims who are responsible for the film and those who react and so forth, and ourselves and so forth. But again, it's something that, and again, we have to realize that even though there's no excuse for violence, and even though, you know, nobody should ever kill an ambassador or anything like that, we completely condemn that, that we have to realize that there is a deeper reality to something like that that's going on in the Middle East. And that's something that has to be said. There is a deeper reality, and the deeper reality is decades of occupation, colonization, oppression, killing, and bombing and stuff and, and things like this that have occurred in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Palestine and so forth. This is also some of the resentment, uh, if you read an article, Why They Hate Us, too. There's an article that's talked about this by a non-Muslim who wrote the article. But he's saying but basically there's a deeper reason why some of the Muslims in the East resent the West. And it's not so much of a film. It's not just a film uh, sparked this huge violent protest or something like that. It's a lot more to it and it's a lot deeper than that. And so we have to look at the, some of the other reasons why uh, they would, Muslims have that resentment and, 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 and anger towards the West, even though that's not necessarily justified in, in them reacting or overreacting or being violent. Yes? I mean, was, was a perfect opportunity for a lot of writers to write mean things, but there's one particular writer who wrote a very short but very fair article on condemning the attackers um, in Libya, but not to, making sure to separate them from the religion and the nation, mm -hmm. and at the same time also condemning um, the guy who made the film, saying that that, I mean, that was clearly out to offend people. Yeah. And it's a very short article featured in the Seattle Times, I would really suggest if anyone wants to sort of defend the Prophet or like defend Muslim images, I think it'd be really nice if everyone could center a short email of thanks. Um, because a lot of the times these journalists get a lot of hate mail and hate calls in response to writing such fair um, articles. And, and they might, because of that, they might be afraid and be demotivated and not write such fair, fair articles. If us as Muslims, especially since a lot of us are students, um, it would really be encouraging for the lady writer as well as us sort of, you know, non-violently defending our religion. If anyone would like to do that, you can come see me afterwards or I can write my email on the board later. Um, but putting that out there. JazakAllah khair, thank you. Uh, what's the article called? called? <laughs> okay, can't just Google it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> khair. So, alhamdulillah for that. Um, so, inshallah, that's one of the things that is, you know, we're going to talk about in terms of today and how to respond and react. And again, it is important to realize that uh, the majority of protesting is peaceful, right? And people are just showing their, their love for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And then there are uh, minor, you know, sex or extreme fringe groups that are making it violent. And, and if you look reality of some of the things that they're saying, and and Libya, is that it was premeditated, a lot of it was. They were just waiting for the opportunity. It's people who wanted to do it anyway, they were just waiting for it. It, was, it had been attacked before. The, the embassy was attacked previously, but they weren't successful, I guess, in their attacking, and so they were waiting for the right opportunity. They saw the protest, boom. It really had nothing to do with the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, had nothing to do with his sunnah or his character, had probably nothing to do with the film. It was just opportunists looking for an opportunity. So, uh, you know, we, we have to look at it. I mean, when Seattle Times put 31 images in the newspaper, front page of Muslims, you know, ah, screaming, shouting, with beards, and something burning in the background. There's always got to be something burning in the background. <laughs> Why is there always something burning in the background? It's like if it bleeds, it leads, right? So you have to put that front page. So, I mean, let's, let's fairly portray Muslims. Let's fairly portray, you know, the actions and character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu not just violent Muslims screaming and shouting with something burning. So, it, it, you know, that's, that's another thing, too, is, 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 is to accurately see it and report it and so forth, and that, that does no way represents Islam or the majority of Muslims, or it's definitely not the character and the, and the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so what is, the, what is one of the things we can do now as Muslims? One of the greatest things we can do now as Muslims is be proactive, not reactive. You see, we're such in a reactive state. Something happens, we react, and we overreact, and we protest, da 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 We react, and then you write an article, and, this, and then that's a, there's a reaction, and a constant reaction after reaction after reaction, right? Instead of reacting as Muslims to everything that's done, we need to be proactive and actually embodying the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, living his sunnah, 
acting upon his character, implementing his mannerisms, dealing with people, Muslim and non-Muslims, the way he used to deal and interact with them. We need to go back to his tradition and his sunnah, which is what this class is all about, you see, and be proactive in doing so. And then they'll really see who the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu really is. And then they'll love him. And then they'll want to know more about him. And then they'll end up following him and following the religion he, he, he brought. You see, that's the answer. That's really the answer to this problem. You see, and, and, and in this sense, it is only our bad actions and shortcomings as Muslims to following his way and his religion that other people see Islam and him in a negative light. You see, they're not drawing pictures in Charlie Hebdo about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi They're not producing films in Southern California about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're producing films, writing articles, websites, uh, newspaper articles, all, the, all this for, you know, is a response to what they see in the Muslims themselves. The actions and the character of the Muslims is what they're showing in, in YouTube, is what they're writing in articles, as pictures are showing in the satirical film, Charlie Hebdo. All these things is a reaction to what they're seeing in Muslims. And if we accurately represent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we accurately represent this deen and the way he was, then they wouldn't be writing these types, they wouldn't be showing these types of images. You see. And that's why when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they would go out to the four corners of the world to give da'wah, does anybody know how many Sahaba there were at the time of the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Huh? Yeah, huh? About 110,000, around 110,000 companions were, were were alive when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam died. How many were buried in in Baqiyah, buried in the Haram, Mecca, Medina area? How many were stayed in that area? Huh? Yeah, about 10,000. So where is the other 100,000? They went to the four corners of the world spreading the religion of Islam peacefully. Not with the sword, with good character, the character of the Prophet ﷺ. You see, so that's why you have Muslims who are buried in China. Some of the Sahaba are buried in China. Some are buried in Russia. Some are in India. They went everywhere in the known world at that time. You see, and it's at this point that when they would go to a village, the people, they would say, hey, is your prophet like this? Is he like that? And some of them went so far that they would actually draw a physical picture, which is prohibited in our religion to draw actually a physical image of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but they would draw it. And it would be extremely accurate. And then the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would say, how did you know what he looked like? How did you know how he was? And then they would respond by saying, we saw him in you. We saw him in you. And that's how we knew what he looked like. That's how we knew who he was. And they don't see him in us. And that's why they draw bad pictures and write bad films and make bad films. Because they don't see him in us. And it's only until they see him in us that they'll have a positive, accurate image and portrayal of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is how we need to respond. And then kind of shifting gears, inshallah to the purpose of this class. This is part of the introduction, inshallah, also going over purpose. Did you have a question? In a nutshell, huh? <laughs> That's a tongue twister, huh? Actually, for the article, as well as the content. So things like that, right, we can, once we get the email list, we can send that. You know, people can choose to read it or not, but, you know, we can send it at least and stuff like that. Uh, things relative like this to the class and stuff would be great. So, inshallah, the purpose of this class is to know who Rasulullah Sallallahu is and then therefore to follow his way in the sunnah and then therefore uh, be beloved by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and have our sins forgiven. Does that, does that make sense? You, know, you follow Rasulullah and Allah loves you and then he forgives you for your sins. How would you know that? Why? 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 Who said? Huh? Allah said in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-jim, laqad kana lak, He says, Qul in kuntum tuhibboon Allah, fattabi'uni, yuhbibukum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhanubukum, wallahu ghafooru rahim. Allah says in the Quran, Say, if ye do love Allah, follow me, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah will love you and forgive you your sins, for Allah is our forgiving most merciful. Well, isn't that interesting? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah will, will love you. And He will forgive you for all your sins. And Allah is the most merciful, the most gracious. 
And the interesting thing, if you look at the Arabic, there's what's called a data shart. It's an instrument, a conditional instrument in Arabic called in. In. And that's how the ayah, the beginning of the ayah starts. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah. If you, if you love Allah, huh? if you say you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Then follow me. Follow Rasulullah sallallahu And then it's conditional based upon the previous. And if you do this, this is a condition. If you do this, يُحْبِبُكُمْ Allah. Then Allah will love you. If you follow Him, Allah will love you. But only if you follow Him. Conditional sentence. Then Allah will love you and forgive you for your sins. What's the greatest thing you can acquire in your life? What's the greatest thing you can attain? Huh? The love of Allah. Is there anything greater than the love of Allah? So, we as Muslims have to love Allah. We have to love God. But God doesn't have to love us. He doesn't have to. He's God. He does whatever He wants. He can love you. He doesn't have to. So then how do you attain the greatest achievement of your life and in the, this life and the next life? That is to attain the love of Allah. How do you attain that? To following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, Allah, Allah loves us. We, 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 we pray that Allah loves us. That's the greatest thing we can have. But what if we have a lot of sins, which we all have? We're imperfect human beings. We have our own shortcomings. We're deficient. We're weak. We're not perfect. Yeah. So uh, Allah, I love you. Allah, I pray you love me. But I have a lot of sins, man. <laughs> Got a lot of baggage. Help me. Help me with this. How, how do I get that pardoning? How do I get that forgiveness? By following the sunnah of Rasulullah The best we can, according to our abilities, according to our circumstances, we try our best to follow him and everything. And again, it's not just, oh, you have to look like me. Yeah, you know, the beard and the kufi and then. No, it's not just that. It's more than that. It is, that is part of it. Yes, the outward appearance, the dress, that is part of it. We, that is part of the sunnah of Rasulullah But most importantly, is the inward sunnah is the inward sunnah the way he, he was. His, like we said, his character, mannerisms, interactions, dealings, right? The way he treated people, the way he lifted them up, the way they felt like they were the most beloved person to, to, to him. Every person thought they were the most beloved person to Rasulullah because the way he treated them, he made them feel special. You see? And that's why you have the companion who goes up to Rasulullah, he says, <clears throat> Ya Rasulullah, because he thinks you know, he's the most beloved uh, person to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And reality is, he's not. <laughs> but he thought he was. Because he thought, because, well, the way he treats me, you know, I'm special to him. Right? But that's how he treated everybody. So he goes to him, he goes, Ya Rasulullah, who's more beloved to you? Me? Or Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, right? Abu Bakr Siddiq is the great, best friend of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's many hadith. لو تخذت خليلا تتخذت أبا بكر خليلا. If I were to take somebody as a best friend, I would take Abu Bakr as a best friend, right? لو وزنا إيمان أهل الأرض على إيمان أبي بكر Siddiq, لو رجح إيمان أبي بكر. That if the, the faith of everybody in the world was compared to the faith of Abu Bakr Siddiq that the faith, the iman of Abu Bakr Siddiq would outweigh the faith of everybody on the world. That's everybody. That's you, me, all the scholars, all the saints, all the, all the uh, other than the prophets and messengers, all the other companions, right? That his faith would outweigh theirs. theirs. These are sahih hadith. These are authentic hadith, right? So this is who Abu Bakr Siddiq is. And he, he, when he was asked, Man ahabba nasi laik, who is the most beloved of people to you? He said, Aisha. He said, Aisha, my wife. Wa min rijal abuha. And from the men, her father. So her father is the most beloved of men to me, but from the most beloved of women was Aisha. That was after Khadijah, of course. Khadijah was the most, that's his special, the first you know, wife who was 15 years older, right? And also she'd been divorced twice. She'd been married twice. She had two kids. And he marries her at the age of 40 when he was 25. Right? That was his first love and first wife. And that was a very special person to him. Because she protected him. She provided for him. She hired him. She helped him when everybody was against him. And then after her was Aisha. Right? But... From the men, it was Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu. And so the Sahabi, right, he's trying to, you know, so, you know, me or Abu Bakr, Ya Rasulullah, who's, who's the most beloved, who's more beloved, me or him? And Rasulullah saw some being as honest he is, he says, Abu Bakr. <laughs> so, all right, all right, fine. <coughs> yeah, mm -hmm. okay, I get that one. Abu Bakr is Abu Bakr, he's special, right? So between me and uh, Omar, yeah, me or Omar, who's more beloved to you? He's like, Omar, he's like, oh, okay, that's Omar al Khattab, yeah, I understand. What about Uthman? He's like, Uthman. He's like, what about Ali? He's like, Ali. He's like, yeah, never mind. <laughs> 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 I want to go down the list. 
right? But that's how he thought. He thought he was special. And because that's how Rasulullah Sallallahu treated him. That's the inward sunnah, you see. And again, we, like we talked about last year, the purification of the soul, right? Removing the diseases from our heart, adorning our heart with beautiful attributes and, decora and, 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 and praiseworthy uh, characteristics. This is the inner sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is far more important, but also uh, what is important is the outward sunnah too. So, this is what Allah says, and then we are ordered in the Qur'an, or we are told in the Qur'an, to take him as our example. In a day and age, when we take a lot of people as our examples, right? Kobe Bryant, eh? LeBron James, eh? Lady Gaga, some people. Eh? <laughs> no? Eh? <laughs> what else they got out nowadays? Huh? Tell me, what else, what else is it? Huh? Bill Gates. Bill Gates, you know, uh, you know, anyway, I, the, the whole point is, I used to know all these things, but the whole point is, you know, that, that if you look in the popular culture and what people are taking as, uh, you know, what's this, Justin Bieber, Biber, <laughs> I don't know his name. <laughs> A lot of people talk about him, too. I asked the youth, I sit and I ask the youth, so who's hot right now? You know, who's, who's the guy who's in the media? I, I actually want to know. So I, I mean, I, then I tell them in a the chuppah, don't follow this person. <laughs> <laughs> follow Rasulullah. <laughs> They're like, man, I told them that guy. Dang it. <laughs> it's like, man. Eh. So, you know, you have a lot of examples, you know, that are in the pop culture or in the media, whether they're intellectuals, whether they're multimillionaires or billionaires, or whether they're sports athletes or famous singers or actresses or actors or whoever it is that naturally people will follow. People like to imitate. The, hu the human nature is to imitate, is to follow somebody. You will follow somebody whether you know it or not. The issue, the question becomes, who are you following? Right? And if we're following Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi he's the greatest example. He's the greatest person you can follow. All right? And then other than him, where, where is it going to take us? No, really, where is it going to take us in the next life? Right? If I want to be, you know, like people say, to, people say, well, that's, that's Rasulullah, how are we going to follow his sunnah? He's at such a high level and station, and he did so many things, how are we going to follow his sunnah? How are we going to do what he did? Right? It's just, it's, that's him. Right? Well, why are you following Bill Gates' sunnah? Huh? Why, why, are you following? why are you trying to be Kobe Bryant's sunnah? Huh? sunnah. Why, why are we following everybody else's sunnah? You know, and trying to say, well, yeah, but that's, you know, well, I'm trying to be like this person. Well, at least try your best. At least we should try our best to be like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and take him as a, the greatest of examples. And this is something Allah says in the Quran. He says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا He says, certainly you have in the Messenger of Allah an excellent exemplar for, hi for him or her who hopes in Allah and the later day and remembers Allah much. So if we are people who hope in Allah, we hope in the later day of having a good outcome, the day of judgment. We hope, uh, if we do a lot of dhikr, remembrance of Allah, then we should, as Allah says, take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our example. And Allah says, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا سُبُلًا فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سِبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ مُصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Again, very relevant to our days today. He, and it is he who commanded you, saying, this is my path. This is my Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is my path. See, here Allah says, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا That this is my straight path. You see, سِرَاطِ, it's يَالْ مُتَكَلَّمْ This is my straight path. Who is he referring to? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, when they say, اِهْدِينَ سِرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمًا In the Fatiha, guide us to the straight path. Whose straight path? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's straight path. Because he is the straight path of Allah. وَقُولْ وَأَنَّ هَذَا That this, this, سِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا is my straight path. فَاتَّبِعُهُ So follow it. And do not follow other paths because it will take you away from the true path which is the path of the, the, the way that of the, the path of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And so we have to be cautious of this, especially in our day and age. Right? Like we said, we're following uh, all different types of people, all different role models, all different religious figures, all different intellectuals. We're following all different types of millionaires and billionaires and sports athletes. We're doing that in our time. Right? And we're neglecting to follow the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And a lot of that has to do with accessibility. He's just not accessible to us. Right? We, don't, we don't actually search him out and read about him and learn about him, which is the purpose of this class. But we go to Google, any, you know, Google News or Google anything, and boom, you see all these pictures and things and articles about what's happening in the you know, current times and media and so forth and sports and all this stuff. And you, you, it's very accessible to us. Everybody's talking about it. But nobody's talking about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Huh? You know, so he's not as accessible to us. And that's why if you look 
And some of the research that is done, they did a survey, and they found that the number one thing that Americans like to speak about is their work, you know, the career, the work, and so forth. The number two thing they like to speak about is sports. Right? And this is, this, is, this is done by non-Muslims. It's not a biased survey. It's a non-Muslim survey. And then they like to talk about politics. And also, what's like number three or four for men, guess what men like to talk about? Number three or four on the list. Huh? Huh? Number three or four on the list. Huh? Don't you deny it now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> number three or four on the list. The yeah, the weather, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. It says it's, it's, it's women. That's oh, no, number three or four. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Number three on the four list was, was women, actually. And then the last thing people like to talk about is religion, right? Religion. And so that's what we need to bring back in, is to talk about religion. Talk about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi make him accessible, expose him to people, and then you'll see them follow and love him, if you really knew who he was. And so this is where we see... Like, you know, and, and again, there's good and bad things we can take from Christians and Jews and non-Muslims, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of good things even the Prophet Muhammad took, right? He says, أَسْتَقَ الْقَوْلْ مَا قَالَهُ لَبِيد الشَّعْرَ لَبِيد The most, the truest of things that anybody said was what لَبِيد, the, the poet said لَبِيد. This is in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And he says, مَا خَلَ اللَّهَ مَا خَلَ اللَّهَ بَاطِلَ بَاطِلُ He says, in this line of poetry, everything other than God is false. It's fake. It's not real. It's an illusion including me, including ourselves. Everything other than Allah is not really real. Allah is real, that's why it's called Al-Haq, the real. And everything else is fake in reality, right? And so this is what Labid says, he was before he was Muslim. He, was, he became Muslim, but he was not Muslim at the time, right? And he still took that from him and he took other benefits from non-Muslims. There's a lot of other instances, no need to go into depth, but he took benefit from non-Muslims. But there are some things we have to be cautious in following non-Muslims or things that are not in ways uh, contrary or contradicting in the ways of Islam. And in this sense is where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, uh, لَا الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ حَتَّى لَوْ دَخَلُوا جُحْرَ ضَبًّا لَدَخَلْتُمُوهَا that, that you will follow people who came before you that even to the point where if they were to crawl into a جُحْرَ ضَبًّا is the whole, is a, is a, it's a sand lizard the hole of a sand lizard, that you would enter into that hole. And then they say, who is that? Is that like, you know, the, the, you know, the, the people before the Christians, the Jews, the non-Muslims, you know, and so forth? And he said, who, who, who else would it be? Right? And again, that's not in everything. That is in what? The things that may be contrary or contradictory to Islam. Right? Not necessarily other benefits and good things that are not. And then we should take it and use it. That's good. It's benefit. Right? And so when he says this, he loses juhra dabban. Juhra dabban is, a, is if the sandler is a deep, windy hole. You see? And once you go, he, the reason why the desert lizard does this is to protect itself from predators. That when a predator goes in there like a snake, it actually gets lost. Or, and until eventually starves and dies. Because there's so many winding maze paths and everything. And this is the actual description he used. Is that once you go down that route, it's hard to get out. You see, you go windy deep, oh man, I can't find my way out of this. You see, and he said, you'll follow them into that. And that's why, you know, and again, this is in, in, in bad behavior, bad characteristics. And that's something we should be cautious of. All, as far as good characteristics and good behavior, take from everybody. Learn from everybody, benefit from everybody. Right? And then another ayah that I wanted to go over is he says, وَمَا أَتَاكَمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخَذُوا وَمَا نَحَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْإِقَابِ And whatsoever the messenger giveth you, take it. And whatsoever he forbiddeth you, abstain from it and keep your duty to Allah. Lo, Allah is, ster uh, is stern in, re in, re in reprisal. And then he says, وَأَنَّبِيُوا أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ The Prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves. He takes precedence. He comes first. The word Ola in Arabic, the one who comes first, the one who takes precedence, the one who's closest. He's closer to you. He's more merciful to you than you are yourself. He cares more about you than you care about yourself. You see, and that's why he wanted so much good for you. You know, now and forever. And all the Muslims, and the non-Muslims too. You see, and he is an Nabil Ola. He's, he takes precedence. He comes first. Right? He, even over our own children, our own parents, our own families, all the people, our own wealth. Our cars, our houses, our education. He comes first. And what, and what he did. And, w and us following him. That's why you see in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And also in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, 
He says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون حب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين. He says, none of you would truly believe. Now, it doesn't mean you don't believe. You have the pinnacle of faith, complete faith. Until I become more beloved to him or her than their own child, than their own parents, than all the people. And one narration says, in, the, in all their wealth and all the people. Okay. And that's why when Umar ibn Khattab, you know, who's, mashallah, Umar ibn Khattab, you know, he's kind of very strict, very kind of hard a little bit, you know, but very also gentle and soft and loving at the same time. Umar ibn Khattab, he comes to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I just want to tell you something. I love you. <laughs> Uh, this is actually a masculine thing. Uh, I, I love you. He said, I love you for the sake of Allah. And I love you more than anything. He, he's actually trying to brag. He said, I love you more than anything except for myself. Yeah, I don't love you more than myself. Because myself is myself and that's a big thing. And you know, my nafs is, that's a whole different story, right? And Rasulullah's response was, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من نفسي التي بين جنبي. None of you would truly believe until I become more beloved than his, his or her own self between his or her own flanks. Like, in other words, yourself between your two sides. You, know, the, you. Right? None of you would truly believe until that is a reality. And so Omar had to think about that. <coughs> so he goes away and he thinks about it. And he reflects and he comes back and he says, Ya Rasulullah, al-an Right now, you're more beloved to me than everything, including my own self. And Rasulullah's response was, Al-an Umar, Al-an Umar. Now, Umar, now you have reached faith. Now you have reached and completed your Iman. Right? And so he has to be more beloved than our own selves. Right? And he takes precedence over our own selves, our own desires, our own caprice, our own opinions, intellectual whims, uh, carnal desires, nature, this and that. He, his way, his sunnah, his religion takes precedence and comes first over everything else, including our mother, children, wealth, everything else. And that's a huge thing, and that's a hard thing for most people, right? And including myself, but that's something that we have to realize that where he stands with Allah, when we say grace of creation, that's not a simple thing. We say grace of creation. What does that mean? What is creation? Huh? What is creation? What is creation? Your creation? Your children, your parents, your house, your car, your family, relatives, uh, your education, your college, everything, the stars, the moon, the oceans, the lakes, mountains, sun, galaxies, dark matter, uh, universe, get everything, black holes, gold, silver, jewelry, pearls, money, trees, which only comes from trees. Uh, it's only trees, it's green trees. Uh, and green trees. Uh, 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 Everything is creation. Other than Allah, everything is creation. And the greatest of all that, including the throne of Allah, is creation. The footstool, the kursi, and the arsh of Allah, the throne, and the footstool of Allah, is creation. And everything other than Allah is creation, and the greatest of all creation is the Prophet Muhammad So why wouldn't he take precedence? Huh? Huh? Why wouldn't he take precedence? So, mashallah, we have a, we have a chorus, <laughs> chorus in the background. Don't you guys agree? Sing out loud. <laughs> Right. Mashallah. So, inshallah, the last verse is in this introduction of the course that I wanted to go over is what happens when we take other than Rasulullah as an example. And this is a type of a, a warning of a, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, but something that we should heed to and realize is Allah says in the Quran, Yoma Yaudu Dalimu ala Yede, Yakulu Ya Laitani Tahatu Ma Rasuli Sabila, Ya Wayleta, Laitani Lam at Tahatulan and Khalila, Lakad Adalani and Adikri Bada Idjaani, Wakana Shaitanu, Lil Insani Khadula. The day that the wrongdoer will bite at his hands, and this is something on the day of judgment, the wrongdoer, the oppressor, will actually will bite at their hands. They'll bite their nails at first, and then that won't be enough because of the fear that they have of meeting Allah. They'll actually bite their fingers all the way till they bite off their whole hand and then their hand will go back and then they'll bite over and over again. This is the oppressor. So be careful of oppression. Huh? We never oppress people. Right? So the day that the wrongdoer will bite at his hands or her hands, he will say, oh, by the way, when, in Arabic, just to clarify, you'll see this in the Hadith too. In Arabic, huwa means him or her. Right? It's not a sexist thing, it's not a gender thing, it's nothing like that. Huwa in Arabic means him or her, it means both. Okay? He only means her. That's how they know it's specific for women. See, women are special. See, they have one word just for themselves. Hua means him or her. 
But in English, obviously, when it, it, they say him, they, you know, they think, oh, that's excluding her. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's translating the Arabic, which means him or her. So anytime you hear me say him in Arabic in the Quran or the ayats, what you'll hear, instead of me saying everything twice, that means him or her. Okay? So the day that the wrongdoer will bite at his hands, he will say, oh, with that I had taken a straight path with the messenger. Ah, woe is me, would that I had never taken such a one for a friend. He did lead me astray from the message of Allah after it had come to me. Ah, the evil one is but a traitor to man. That is Satan himself. So the day the oppressor will bite at his hands or her hands, and they'll say, oh, if I only would have taken the messenger as an example, as a leader, as a guide. Oh, woe to me, uh, I shouldn't have taken so-and-so, whoever that so-and-so is. We all have that so-and-so, you know. For me, it was like Reggie Smith, or it was like, you know, the, the, the football player, the, you know, the, the famous, you know, person in the NFL at the time, you know, or some famous actor, singer, rapper, or something like that, or something like that. And he says, oh, if I wouldn't have taken so-and-so uh, as an example uh, instead for that person, whoever, that, if, if that person fits that role, that person sent me astray from the remembrance of God after it had come to me, and then and the Satan is indeed a traitor to mankind. And that's the last ayah, and then to close, inshallah, as this introduction, inshallah, starting next class, we'll go straight into the hadith, the actual book itself. But I wanted to do a, a good introduction for the book and the course and the purpose. And then lastly, I just want to mention a couple stories about people such as the Sahaba themselves who did follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and how far they went in following his Sunnah. So one of the examples we have is the example of Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar is the son of Umar ibn Khattab. And he was one of the most, uh, you know, adhering to the sunnah of the Prophet, so even little things. Like, you know, you have sunnahs like, you know, you should pray this much, you should fast that much. There's these acts of worship that are sunnah, but the Sahaba, some of them would go so far, they would do cultural things, customary norms. They would do just normal things uh, following the sunnah because that's what the Prophet Muhammad did. Not acts of worship, just because he did it. And so Abdullah ibn Umar, one time they were on their way to Hajj, and they was in a group, and so he's going on his, uh, his camel, and he stops, and then he sees a tree, and then he takes his camel around the tree three times. Walks his camel three times around a tree. Like you would think like, like it's a little OCD or something like that. What is he doing three times around a tree, right? Like what is he doing? And so the Sahaba are like, what are you doing? <laughs> We're on our way to Hajj. Why are you doing that? <laughs> Absolutely no point. And his response was, verily I saw Rasulullah Sallallahu in his lifetime do this. And so I did it after his death. So even after he died, he said, you know, I'm going to go there and do it three times just like he did. What does it have to do with anything? It's not an act of worship. It's, he's doing it because his, 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 his beloved did, did it. The poet said that verily the lover obeys his beloved. And people do it all the time, my friends. Eh? People have a loved one, whether their husband or their wife. People love their children, they love their, maybe their boss or their whatever. They follow people. Yani they follow people. They'll do what they obey people and do what they say. So why shouldn't we love and follow Rasulullah So that's what he did. And another example is Ibn Mas'ud. Now Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was known to be shorter in stature, right? And so he, you know, the Sahaba would make fun of him because they say he was about a meter and a half. When, he, when the wind would blow too hard, he would actually fall over. <laughs> and then he'd get back up and fall over, poor guy. And then uh, they said that when he, would, he climbed a palm tree to get some of the uh, coconuts and stuff like that, uh, when he would do that, uh, or sorry, some of the dates, he would climb a palm tree to get some of the dates, and when he would do that, uh, the Sahaba would sit and chuckle at his skinny legs from behind, you know, like chicken legs kind of. So they would laugh at his skinny legs, and then the Prophet said, Do not, don't make fun of uh, Ibn Masood, for verily his legs will be heavier than the mountain of Uhud on the Day of Judgment. Right? So you don't think just because he's small in stature that he's not a big man. He's a big man and he will come heavier than, his legs will come heavier than the mountain of Uhud, a big mountain in, in the Arabian Peninsula on the, on the Day of Judgment. And so Ibn Mas'ud, one day he was riding his horse and he was riding under this branch which was like, you know, because he was smaller, he was, the branch was way over his head. And so he's riding and he just ducked like this, like, you know, like that, underneath the branch. And the Sahara started laughing at him like, Dude, like, why'd you, dude, why'd you, why'd you just duck, man? <laughs> like, why'd you just duck? You know, if you would have stood, you probably wouldn't have hit the branch. <laughs> why would you duck, you know? And so he says that, verily, I saw Rasulullah Sallallahu do that in his lifetime. Rasulullah Sallallahu was much taller than him. So he said, I saw him do it in his lifetime, so I did it out. <laughs> just like he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, Rasulullah did it for a reason, you know. 
because he's much bigger than you, right? <laughs> That's how far they went, right? And then, you know, we have other examples like uh, Anas ibn Malik. Uh, he was a servant of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Anas ibn Malik, um, he did, what he did is, he never used to like what's called a, a type of, uh, what is it called, Zuc uh, zucchini? Yeah, I believe zucchini. Uh, he never used to. He never used to like it. Or squash. That's right. Squash is translated as it's a type of khudr, type of vegetable, obviously that the Arabs talk about, and uh, qitha is called. He never used to like squash. And then one day he walked in serving the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he saw that he was eating squash, and he was saying how much he really liked squash. And so he says that after that day, I ate squash and loved it. I, I loved squash and ate it all the time, all the way until he died. You know. So he obviously did not like something. Again, it's not an act of worship. It's just food. Right? He didn't like it, and then all of a sudden he saw the Prophet he didn't like it, and then he liked it, and ate it all the way till death. You see? And so, so this is how far they went in, his, in loving him, attaching themselves to him, and following the Sunnah. And inshallah, Allah gives us the tawfiq, the success to also love him like this, and have that attachment with him, and follow his Sunnah as well, and know all about him. And this whole purpose of this course is to know Rasulullah and then if you know him, you'll love him, and if you love him, you'll follow him, and try to be like him. And look at the simple equation. He is the most beloved of creation to Allah, okay? How do you become the most beloved of creation to Allah? Hmm? A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. Eh? Is that true? <laughs> eh? right. If that's true, you f the closer you are to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the closer you are to Allah. The more you follow him, the more Allah loves you because he's the closest and most beloved of, Allah, of creation to Allah. The closer you are to him, the more you love him, the more you follow him, the more Allah will love you, the more you'll be closer to him. That's how it works. You see, so he is that gateway, he is that door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although, otherwise, why, why would he send a messenger? Yeah. Just here you go, here's the Quran. Do it yourself. Teach yourself, you know, Dean. Just look it up on Sheikh Google. Sheikh, Sheikh Bing. Just look it up, you know. Just Google it, you know. Google. Awesome. Uh, Google Islam. <laughs> YouTube. Uh, that's it. Right? No, he sends messengers for reasons to be, to be followed.